I'd like to welcome you again to this, uh, our fourth session in our series of lectures, studies of the Gospel of Mark that we have been taking during this season of Lent. As we begin today in this fourth session, I'd like to go back to some things that we talked about in the opening session, in session one, about the context and the setting of Mark's Gospel. It's helpful, I think, to keep in mind uh, something, whatever we can discover, about the nature of Mark's Gospel and what it says about the setting or the context in which Mark was written. It's helpful to recall that uh, from what we can gather, it's very likely that the Gospel of Mark is written sometime in the middle of the first century. And helpful to recall especially that by the time that Mark writes, other familiar author that we read in the New Testament, namely the Apostle Paul, and his letters that he writes to the churches that are part of his mission, already are past history for Mark's community. M Paul most likely spent his time in his missionary journeys during the 50, the 50 to the 60 year part of the first century. And we assume, at least the strong tradition is that, that the Apostle Paul was taken prisoner, spent time in prison, and was eventually martyred in the city of Rome sometime around the year 60 AD likely under the emperorship of the Emperor Nero. So when we think about the New Testament, all of Paul's writings, such as Thessalonians and Philippians and the letters to Corinthian and the Galatians, and especially his last letter to the, to the church at Rome, were already uh, some, several decades past by the time that Mark probably was written. Most scholars assume that Mark was the earliest of the Gospels that we possess to be written. And we might imagine or ask the question, what was it that drove Mark to write a Gospel, to invent this new way of telling the story of Jesus? There are no Gospels ant uh, antedating Mark and in that sense, a gospel, or what we know as a gospel, was perhaps Mark's invention. So it's interesting to speculate about why he chose this particular way to tell the story, especially since it is not sat for by any of the examples that we have in Paul's writings. It is a new venture. It is not a letter like Paul writes to his congregations. But at the time Mark writes then, there are Christian communities all over the Mediterranean world by this time. Mark tells us essentially nothing about who he is. The name Mark is not included among the disciples of Jesus, and we have no record of who Mark is, and we can only imagine or speculate. The only clues that we can get are those which we might get from the writing itself, and Mark gives us no clue. This is different from what is the situation with the writer of the Gospel of Luke, for example, who at the beginning of his Gospel writes in the first four verses with words like this, even as much as many others have undertaken to write a story of what happened among us, it seemed good to me also, having followed things closely, to write what, a, an account, since I am not an eyewitness, but I've done my homework, and so I want to set you straight in terms of how things actually happened. But Mark tells us no such thing. And so we are left to imagine, when did he write? And to whom did he write this gospel? The only thing we can do is imagine by see seeking to read between the lines and to imagine who are the people to whom he writes. 
There have been many prop proposals. Some imagine that perhaps it was written in the city of Rome or around that environment. Others imagine that it might have been Asia Minor. It's certainly possible that it might have been written in the land of Palestine, but most people assume it was written in the Gentile world. Unfortunately, we have no tradition to let us know. We have no data. We do not have a table of contents or an author's signature to help us with those ventures, so we are left to our own imaginings. Suffice it to say, as we noted in our first session, that most assume that Mark was written sometime around the destruction of the temple and the end of the Jewish war of 66 through 70. Why would we imagine this? We will see that in our lecture today, perhaps judging from the way in which Mark in his gospel talks about the temple, the way in which Mark imagines the future, the way in which Mark talks about the Messiah and the expectations of the Messiah deliverer. Sometime later in the first century, other gospel writers come along, such as Matthew and Luke and John, as you see from the chart in front of us. And each of them writes a gospel, as we have noted in previous lectures, relying strongly on Mark's gospel from which to uh, draw their material. We'll come back to that in a moment. But just to recall then the parts of our journey to this point as we have read the Gospel of Mark. In, our first, le in the first session, we looked at chapters one through three, and we noticed how Mark begins the story and where Mark begins the story and perhaps look at that as kind of strange that Mark would be jump into the story of Jesus when Jesus is already ready to begin his ministry. And he tells us, or has this banner headline over the gospel, this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus the Christ, the Son of God. Then immediately, as we have known, he jumps into the story of the preaching of John the Baptist he looks at the Old Testament scriptures and seeks to adapt those scriptures to the events that are going on in the ministry of John. And then immediately Jesus comes and is baptized by John. He starts preaching and says, the kingdom of God is at, has drawn near, repent and believe in the gospel. And then in the next breath, he is walking alongside the Sea of Galilee, sees fishermen and calls them and says, come follow me. And immediately they drop everything and follow after Jesus. And then he's in a synagogue and a demon recognizes him. He casts out the demon. And by the time we have gone through the opening chapter, of Mark, Jesus has healed diseases, he's cured a leper, he's killed a lame man, and Mark tells us at the end of the second chapter, Jesus has gone all over Galilee. He has followed through all of the cities of Galilee, and people have come to him, and everyone who comes to him, he heals their diseases. It's kind of like a whirlwind beginning to the gospel, and so it is so surprising then that after this banner announcement of Jesus in Mark's gospel, already at the end of chapter three, we see the reference that the leaders, the Pharisees and the Herodians seek to do away with Jesus, to put him to death because he is such a popular leader. What kind of story of God's Messiah is this that already uh, we have uh, seen a kind of whirlwind uh, history of Jesus' ministry only to have the leaders of the religious group want to put him to death? As we turn then to the next section of Mark's Gospel in, in session two, we see that Jesus 
turns to his disciples and the crowds around him and begins to teach them, and he teaches in parables. Mark tells us that this is the only way that Jesus spoke to his disciples. And he says to them, as they ask questions about what do, how do we understand these parables? How do, how do they mean for us? These parables that talk about the kingdom of heaven. Jesus says, the way you understand them is to understand that to you have been given this, a secret of the kingdom and for everyone outside, everything is in parables or in riddles in order that they may not see or understand, in order that they may not come to understand. For it is a gift uh, for you to understand this mystery of the kingdom. And then in this section, we noticed the story of how Jesus continues to heal. And at the same time, the disciples seem to be caught in kind of a turmoil and perhaps the theme of this is that again and again we find Jesus and his disciples on the Sea of Galilee, in a boat, in the midst of the storms of the sea, and they are back and forth on one side and then on the other, in Jewish territory and then in Gentile territory, and the disciples seem to be caught in the midst of this uproar of the sea that also suggests that kind of mystery and that lack of disciple understanding. And finally, in this section, at the end, or in verse 21 of chapter 8, Jesus again is with the disciples in the boat, and they are kind of flailing around, not understanding what's going on. And Jesus says to his disciples, are your hearts so hardened do you not yet understand after you have seen all of the healings and the two double feedings of people in the wilderness, how can you be so, ig so ignorant or so lack with lack of understanding? And we've talked about that matter of the secrecy of the kingdom and the disciple misunderstanding as a particular way in which Mark tells the story. And in our last session, session number three, we then turned uh, at the very climax of the gospel. In the very next breath, uh, as, as Mar Jesus has talked to the disciples about their misunderstanding, in the very next episode, we see that Jesus heals a person who is blind. He opens his eyes in kind of a parable of seeing and believing. And then uh, Jesus immediately turns to his disciples and says, who do you say that I am? And when the disciples begin to say, well, some say you are John the Baptist, others say you are a prophet, Jesus says, I'm talking about you. Who do you say that I am? And Peter then stands up and makes this bold confession uh, in, in the gospel. You are the Messiah. For the first time since the beginning of the gospel, there is a clarity and a straightforward talk about who this Jesus is by one of the disciples. And then immediately after Peter has said this, Jesus turns and says, and yes, the Son of Man came to give his life, and the Son of Man will be arrested, will be put to death, and on the third day will rise again. And at this very center of confession, immediately, Peter responds and says, no way. He rebukes Jesus. And then Jesus in turn rebukes Peter and says, get behind me, Satan, for you are not thinking the ways of God, but you are thinking the ways of human beings. So that leads us into this section of the gospel in chapters 8 through 10, where we see uh, that careful structure that Mark has designed in his gospel 
This section begins with the healing of a blind person and is framed at the end of the section with another story of the healing of a blind person. And in between, we see stories of the way in which Jesus foretells this coming death and resurrection. Three times he does that, and each time followed by a, a section of misunderstanding of the disciples and then a teaching of Jesus in which he leads his disciples to a new understanding of discipleship. He calls them to come and take up their cross and follow him. He tells them that to be great in the kingdom means to be last. The first shall be last and the last shall be first. And he tells them that the Son of Man has come to give his life as a ransom for many. In session four then, we will turn then to what we have described a number of times as the passion and resurrection of Jesus. Many have described, as we've, uh, we see in the handout, have described Mark as a passion narrative with a, ex an extended introduction. And if we take seriously where we are in the Gospel of Mark, where in chapter 8 already, Jesus turns and says to his disciples, the Son of Man is going to be arrested and killed, fully eight of the 16 chapters of Mark are intentionally talking about the passion and death of Jesus. And now for the first time on the very gates of Jerusalem, we turn to Jesus' time in Jerusalem. Another way we might think about that is how much time is spent in the movement of the gospel as we journey through the story. If in the first eight chapters we whip our way through the whole of Jesus' ministry, and then in chapter eight we turn to Jesus' announcement of his coming passion, and now he is on the way to Jerusalem. By the time we get to chapter 11 and Jesus is in Jerusalem, it is the beginning of Holy Week, and everything that happens in chapters 11 through 16 takes place in the span of one week, from Sunday when Jesus enters into Jerusalem to Friday when Jesus is crucified on the cross and then raised again from the dead on the third day. So time stops, if you will. Time shrinks and we focus intentionally on this passion of Jesus. It is like turning the spotlight on the events of this week, which will conclude with the announcement that the uh, person in the empty tomb gives to the women when they come to visit. He has been raised. He is not here. We'll come back to that in a moment. We, see, we have seen that in the outline, then, as we have talked about this in these, in these sessions. We've looked at the opening of the gospel, the transition of Jesus, the crossing of the sea, and then in this section, in the last session, around the foretellings of the Passion. And now we see Jesus in Jerusalem. All of this is a way of talking about the particular way in which Mark has opened up this story of Jesus for us. We have commented on in several times as we've talked about the relationship between Matthew and Mark and Luke that Mark's story is pretty much taken over by the writers of Matthew and Luke uh, in in full places, even though each of them retells or changes the story in significant ways, either by adapting some of the material in Mark's gospel, by adding material that belongs to themselves, and by apparently having access to a s source that has just a collection of the sayings of Jesus, and use that to shape their own gospel. One of the 
uh, familiar ways in which we can see them adapting Mark's gospel is by the fact that each of them, Matthew and Luke, in their own way, add a story of the birth of Jesus at the beginning of their gospel, which Mark does not have. They also tell a story about, for example, the temptation of Jesus in the wilderness at the beginning of his ministry, and they tell it in a very similar way, so much so that most people assume that this story of the temptation in the wilderness is a part of what we might call that saying source, where Jesus uh, argues with Satan uh, and seeks to quell Satan's temptations. One of the things that looking at this picture helps us to do is to then invite us, as many readers have done, to compare the ways in which each of the gospel writers tells the story, and the comparison helps us to highlight what is distinct and what is unique about the way in which Mark tells the story. And so now we turn to look at some of those things that are part of Mark's special way of telling the story of Jesus. So as we have said, many have said one of the things that's characteristic of Paul's uh, or of Mark's writing is that uh, the passion narrative seems to impinge itself on the whole story of Jesus. As we noted a moment ago, already in chapter 3, we hear that the Pharisees and the Herodians are out to put Jesus to death. And we've seen the foretellings of Jesus' passion again and again in chapters 8 through 11. So the passion becomes a special part of Mark's gospel uh, as he seeks to tell the story. And as we say here, the overwhelming presence of the passion uh, that stands as a background behind the, the story as we read it. One of the things that that offers uh, to a reading of Mark's gospel is a tremendous sense of irony. And many have called attention to the way that Mark's gospel has so much in its components of irony. What do we mean by irony? Irony means that we read the story at different levels and what is on the surface is not the same as what hides below the surface. And it is a kind of irony that on the one hand, we announce that Jesus is the Messiah and he comes uh, to hear the diseases of the people. He comes to bring the kingdom of God in our midst. And yet in the background is that overwhelming presence of knowing where this journey of Jesus will end. It's also a kind of an irony that Jesus is the Messiah, the very son of David, those whom people expected this one to be the one who would come to, to let the people go, to, to ransom the people Israel. And yet this Messiah is not like the Messiah whom they expected, but one who indeed marches inexorably toward the cross and and his death. We see premonitions of that, as we have noted, along the way in the story. The Pharisees and their attempt to do away with Jesus and the foretellings of Jesus about his passion, as we read in chapters 8 and 9 and 10, as he begins to teach them that the Son of Man must undergo suffering and be rejected, be killed, and after three days rise again. As we stand at the beginning then of chapter 11, the, we, we can see this as a major transition in the story. Even though we've expected this along the way, it is a way in which Jesus makes a turn for the first time to enter into Jerusalem. And as we noted in our last session, just before this, Jesus heals the blind Bartimaeus, and Bartimaeus, once healed, gains his vision and follows Jesus on the way. Follows as a disciple on the way 
which we know is to take them to Jerusalem. And then in the very next verse that begins our chapter 11, we read, when they were approaching Jerusalem. This is a signal that the author gives us to keep reminding us that we are on a journey, that we are on the way to Jerusalem. And now for the first time in Mark's gospel, Jesus is about to set foot in Jerusalem. That is a very different way of telling the story, and all one has to do is pick up the Gospel of John to see how different Mark's telling of the story of Jesus is. It's almost as if Jesus has been lurking out there in Gentile territory and in the north of Galilee all during his ministry, and now suddenly at last, only in the last week of Jesus' life and ministry does he venture into the city of Jerusalem. Jerusalem, which is the center of faith, the center of the scriptures, the center of the holy people of God, and now at last Jesus enters that city. That city. Even that fills the story with kind of a sense of irony and pathos that Jesus should now enter into Jerusalem and then as we follow the story, many of which you, uh, details you are familiar with, we read about his entry into Jerusalem and the songs and praises of a Palm Sunday. We read about the anger and the, the desire of the leaders to, to arrest Jesus. And we read of the Son of Man on trial before the authorities and, bef and before the Roman ruler Pilate and the ultimate irony, you might say, of the gospel is that the very king, the Messiah, the, the one who is the son of David, the Messiah of God, should not come in victory finally, but should be put on a cross and crucified and put to death. That certainly is a major irony in the gospel and certainly something that Mark wants his community to deal with. So let us turn to take a closer look at this story then in the Passion narrative that we read in these last five chapters of Mark's Gospel. So as they are approaching Jerusalem, uh, Jesus tells his disciples, go into the city and you'll find there a colt uh, and uh, untie it and bring it to me. And if anyone asks you what uh, you're doing, say, the Lord has need of it. You know the story. So they went and they found the colt, just like Jesus had told them, and they bring it. And uh, Jesus then gets on the colt and rides into Jerusalem amid the shouts of the people who spread their cloaks on the road, they spread branches and they sing shouts of hymnic quotation of the Old Testament scriptures. Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the coming kingdom of our ancestor David. This is David all over. This is the king we've been looking for. Celebrate, hooray, hallelujah, Hosanna in the highest heaven. These are the shouts that begin the week of Jesus in Jerusalem. And then he goes into Jerusalem, goes into the temple. For the first time, Jesus is at the very heart of the religion of the people of Israel. He goes into the temple, he looks around, and after he's looked around at everything at the end of the day, he turns around and exits the temple and goes back to the little village of Bethany. This is day one of the story of the Passion, and it begins with shouts and hallelujah, and also then sets up an expectation of where this Jesus will be on the throne of the shouts of hallelujah and hosanna of the people. But then on the next day, 
he comes into Jerusalem again and he enters the temple a second time and what does he do there? He begins to drive out the ones who are selling and the ones who are buying in the temple and he overturns the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who would not allow anybody to carry anything into the temple. And he was teaching them, it's written, you shall not make the God's, te the God's temple a house for thieves, but it is a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it a place for robbers and money changers to dwell. Not surprising then that what should happen in the very next breath in the story is, and when the chief priests and scribes heard this, they kept looking for a way to kill him, for they were afraid of him, because the whole crowd was spellbound by his teaching. We've heard this note before in Mark's Gospel, and now it becomes even more real. And once more, Jesus departs from the temple and departs from the city. But on a third time, he comes into Jerusalem on the third day, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priests and the scribes and the elders came to him and they said, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? One, you may recall that at the beginning of Jesus' ministry, when he entered for the first time into the synagogue in chapter 1, verse 27 following, and he cast out the demon who said, I know who you are, you are the Son of God. And the people, when Jesus cast out the demon, we are told they marveled at his authority because he taught them like one with authority and not like their leaders, the Pharisees and the scribes. But now those very Pharisees and scribes come to Jesus or they challenge him and they say, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? And when they ask this question, who gave you this authority? Notice that this is in essence an attack on God. If Jesus is indeed the Messiah of God, then to question Jesus' authority is to ask the very question, is Jesus the Messiah? Is this really God in our midst? And their answer in wanting to put him to death is to say, no, this is not the Messiah we expect. So the authority of Jesus becomes a challenge and we can see that Jesus coming uh, arrest and trial and crucifixion challenges that question of whether or not this good news of the gospel of God, this coming of the kingdom, is indeed what we expect or is it not? This is real stuff that Mark is wrestling with in his telling of the story. And in case we miss it, in the very next breath, Jesus turns again to tell a parable one of the most telling parables in Mark's Gospel, so telling that we see that both Matthew and Luke incorporate this parable whole in their Gospels as well. The story kind of relies upon the Old Testament scriptures where in Isaiah we hear that God has a vineyard and he plants this vineyard and hopes to, to raise fruit from that vineyard but now we hear a diff story of a different vineyard. A man plants a vineyard, puts a fence around it, leases it to tenants, and when the season comes, when things are ripe, when you should expect getting a harvest, think about the story that Jesus talks about the kingdom as like a sower who goes out to sow his fields and the harvest is plentiful, but it grows secretly. So again, we are imagining a harvest. He sends a slave to collect his share of the produce. But what happens in this vineyard? They seize him, they beat him, they send him away empty-handed, and so he sends another slave. And this one they beat over the head and they insult, and then he sent another, and that one they killed. And so it was with many others 
Some they beat, others they killed. And then we read, he had still one other, a beloved son. We have heard that language before and we say, aha, a beloved son. This is where the parable becomes very much like an allegory. Who is this story about? Who is the man who plants a vineyard and owns the vineyard? It doesn't take much imagination to imagine that we are talking about God. We are talking about the kingdom of God. We are talking about the kingdom that has drawn near, a harvest that has come, a harvest that we should look for. But then there is this beloved son. So finally he sent this beloved son to them saying, they will respect my son. But those tenants said to one another, ha ha, this is the heir. Let's kill him and then the inheritance will be ours. Let's do away with him and then we will really get what is ours, what belongs to us. So they seized him, they killed him, and they threw him out of the vineyard. How are we to read this? Well, Mark tells us very quickly uh, how those who heard this parable of Jesus in Jerusalem how they heard it. He asked those hearers, what then will the owner do? He will come and destroy the tenants and give the vineyard to others. There will be others who inherit this, this uh, vineyard and its fruits. Have you not read this in scripture? He, Jesus quotes scripture to them. The stone that the builders have rejected has become the cornerstone and this was the Lord's doing. This is what God is about and it is amazing. And when they realized that he had told this parable against them, they wanted to arrest him, but they were afraid to do it because of the crowds. This is now the second time that we've heard about them wanting to do away with Jesus. So then they turned to trying to trap Jesus in his teaching in Jerusalem. We won't look at those stories, but just to jog your memory, what comes next? The Pharisees and the rulers come and they seek to trap Jesus. They ask him questions about, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar, that foreign ruler? What about the, the debates about the resurrection? Is there really a resurrection? That was a hot debate among Jewish uh, leaders of the day. And what is the first commandment? What, is the, what do the scriptures teach us? And then we read in scriptures that uh, the Messiah is to be called David's son. But how is it then that David calls him Lord? Uh, so inviting Jesus to kind of get on the hot seat and say something that will get him in trouble. But Jesus turns and denounces the scribes and accuses them of knowing how to debate scripture, but then trample on the lives of widows and orphans. And he holds up a, a widow as he points to her in the temple, putting in an offering of everything she has. At this point, Mark takes a kind of a venture to the side. Mark 13 stands as kind of a unit of its own, but it also perhaps is one of the places where people go in Mark's gospel to imagine what is the setting of the gospel, which we've talked about earlier in this lecture. It's sometimes described as a little apocalypse. What is an apocalypse? An apocalypse is a revelation about what is coming in the future. And at the beginning of Mark 13, as Jesus comes out of the temple with his disciples, one of the disciples says to him, and you can kind of imagine the scene in front of us, look, wow, look at the stones of the temple and what large buildings, isn't it magnificent? that we look at this and then Jesus asks him, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left here upon another. Everything is going to be torn down. 
just as an aside then here, this is one of the things that many readers look at as a clue to the setting of when God, Mark's gospel is written. Whatever one imagines then, many readers say, this talk about the tearing down of Jerusalem and of the temple structure shows that the events surrounding Mark's gospel imagine this destruction of the temple and of Jerusalem that surrounds the end of the Jewish war. Of course, that is circumstantial evidence and it's reading between the lines, but it's, it's close to a clue as we might have and perhaps a pretty good one that this is the kind of environment that Mark's readers are living in and the kinds of uh, fears and concerns about the destruction of the temple that may have been uh, exacerbating the people who are trying to understand what it means to be a disciple of Jesus in these confusing and uproarious kinds of times. So when Jesus is sitting on the Mount of Olives looking out at the temple, he teaches his disciples uh, as they ask him the question, tell us, when will this be? What will be the sign that all of these things are about to be accomplished? We might imagine ourselves asking those same kind of questions. What will the future look like? What will it look like for us to be part of the kingdom? Tell us something that will help us understand how to live in these uh, frightful times. And then Jesus begins to say to them, Beware that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name and say, I am he, I am he, I am the Messiah. We can imagine that in, G in Mark's community's own time, there are still people going around saying, I am the Messiah. Wandering prophets who Jesus says, they will lead many astray. So how does one behave? Jesus says to his disciples at the end of that chapter, thinking about this future, but of that day or hour, no one knows, neither the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Not even Jesus, if Jesus is the Messiah, not even Jesus knows when these things will happen. So how do you behave? Jesus says, beware, keep alert because you don't know when this time will come. Therefore, keep awake, for you don't know when the master of the house is going to come, whether it's in the evening, whether it's midnight, or at cockcrow, or at dawn, or else he may come when you're asleep, and when he comes suddenly, and what I say to you, I say to everybody, keep awake, watch. Many have kind of puzzled about this statement of Jesus. Does this say to Mark's community, are we talking about a community that are uh, living at the alert and wondering about the future? Or are we dealing with a community that is so sleepy, they've gone to sleep and are so sluggish that Jesus has to wake them up and say, keep alert be diligent disciples, and the question is how do we read the kind of community to whom Mark is writing and in, uh, in terms of his call to discipleship. With that kind of interlude of thinking about the future, we turn to the story of the passion itself. So at the beginning of chapter 14, we read that it's two days now before the Passover uh, and the chief priests and scribes are looking for a way to arrest Jesus by stealth and put him to death. Now the third time in this section that we hear about them seeking to arrest him. But they said, not during the feast or the people might riot. And at that point when it's evening, uh, Jesus has made ready with his disciples. He comes with the twelve, and when they are ta have taken their places and are eating, Jesus says to his gathered disciples in this room, truly I tell you, one of you will betray me. 
one who is eating with me. And they began to be distressed and to say, which one of us is it? Is it I? Or more likely, the correct translation as the NRSV has captured it, they say, surely it's not I, is it? They all assume it's not one of them. And he says to him, it is one of the 12, the one who is dipping his bread into the bowl. Again, kind of an ironic statement because, of course, every one of the 12 around the table are dipping their hand. So this does not put their finger on the one who is the betrayer. We know in the story because we've read it before. For the Son of Man goes as it is written of him, but woe to the one whom the Son of Man is betrayed. This calls attention again to a strange kind of, of uh, paradox in the story of Jesus' crucifixion. Unless Jesus is betrayed, he will not go to his death and he will not become the Messiah of God's people. But still, it is by God's design that Jesus should uh, give his life as a ransom, but woe to that person by whom that betrayal is done. It would have been better for him not to have been born, Jesus said. So while they're eating, he takes a loaf of bread, blesses it, this is my body, he takes a cup, this is my blood of the covenant poured out for all people, I will never eat and drink of this fruit of the vine until I drink of it, of it with you anew in the kingdom of God. This again is about the coming of the kingdom and points to this sharing of this feast with Jesus as a sign of the presence of God's kingdom among us. And as you know the story in the very next episodes, Jesus goes out with his disciples, prays in Gethsemane, let this cup pass from me. Then along comes uh, Judas with the soldiers. He is betrayed and arrested. Just a, a comment at this point. Uh, some of you may be familiar with Mark's gospel that as Jesus is arrested, there is a young man who is in a cloak who is there and when, the dis and when the soldiers try to grasp him, uh, in a couple verses, Mark says, and he uh, tries to escape uh, so carefully that he leaves his cloak behind and flees naked. Uh, there is nothing in the story in those two verses that tells us who this is, nor does it tell us why this should be an important event in the story. And this has led some readers of Mark to say, aha, as we read between the lines, we think that's Mark's signature. The one who flees naked in the garden probably is like a cameo appearance of the author like we are familiar with sometime in film. Of course that is circumstantial and it is not uh, largely convincing to many readers, but it's a sample of how we try to read in the narrative itself and catch clues that might help us out since we have nothing external to help us with that author. A kind of an interesting tidbit of the story. So then Jesus is placed on trial before the council and as he is on trial before the council, Peter out in the courtyard denies that he knows Jesus, not once, not twice, but three times, just as Jesus has predicted. And then they whip him off to Pilate in the morning, and uh, Pilate puts Jesus to the test. He asks him his questions. Are you the king of the Jews? Are you the Messiah? It's important to recognize, perhaps as an aside, that the word Messiah and king are one and the same. There are th uh, three different words that are sometimes used that are the translation of the word Messiah. Messiah or Mashiach in Hebrew is simply the word for anointed one in the Old Testament. And who is an anointed one? An anointed one is king, such as in the anointing of King David. So to call Jesus Messiah, to call him king, to call him the anointed one, those are just uh, trans different translations of the same term. So 
Pilate, in essence, then says, are you the Messiah? Are you the King of the Jews? And Jesus answered him, you are saying so. That's a kind of a, a hidden or elliptical kind of response of Jesus. Uh, it's kind of like uh, if I said to you, uh, are, you really, are, are you really going to do this? Or I'm going to the, uh, should I go to the fair? You have said so. You have said so says, you've hit it on the head. You've told it squarely. You've answered the truth. So to say you say so, even though it's kind of hidden, is pretty much like saying yes. Uh, it is a response that causes Pilate to asking again, have you no answer then for all these charges that are brought against you? And at this point, we see a feature of Mark's narrative of the Passion. Jesus is silent. This is the only thing Jesus says in the trial scenes. He is silent, he offers no reply, so that Pilate is amazed at his silence that he answers no charges. So Pilate then turns to the multitudes and he says, what shall I do with your king? And you know the answer. They holler out, crucify him, crucify him. So Pilate turns him over to the soldiers. They mock him and spit on him and then whoosh him out to Golgotha where Jesus is placed on the cross. And then we read the scene at that crucifixion. It is noon, darkness comes over the land, and at three o'clock, Jesus cries out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lemma sabachthani, which means, uh, Mark translates it for his readers, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? This is a very interesting and telling point of Mark's gospel. When some of the bystanders heard it, they said, listen, he's calling for Elijah. The only word, so to speak, that Jesus speaks from the cross in Mark's gospel is this outcry of utter dereliction, of utter forsakenness. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And even that cry from the cross is misunderstood by the people who listen. They say, he's calling for Elijah. So even the one word that Jesus speaks as he is on the cross is mis misheard and mistold by the people. So they run and they offer him something to drink. And then the, the uh, uh, joker, so to speak, says, wait. Let's see whether Elijah will come to take him down. <laughs> you can imagine the mockery of this scene as they mistake what it is that Jesus cries. And as readers, as ones who uh, are watching this crucifixion, these words stand out in bold relief as the only cry and the only words of Jesus and it highlights for Mark's story the utter forsakenness of God's Messiah as he suffers death and persecution and uh, desertion even by God. Uh, in the, in the uh, Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus has prayed, not my will but yours be done. Please take this cup away from me. And in some senses, this is the utter answer that Jesus hears on the cross, my God, you have forsaken me. We remember, for example, the disciples as they're in the storms on the, in the boat who say, don't you care for us? We're being deserted. We are going down in the boat. Do you not care for us? Jesus' cry is very similar to that of the frustrated disciples. And then with this last words, he gives a loud cry and he breathes his last, he dies. And as Jesus dies, the curtain of the temple is ripped in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion, the Roman soldier, who stands and watches this, sees that that's the way he dies, he says, truly, this man was God's son, or a son of God. Again, note, 
all of the people surrounding the cross mock and, and the disciples have all fled. Even Jesus' words are misinterpreted and the only one who ventures any kind of comment on who this is, is a Roman centurion. And then at the end, once he is dead, Joseph of Arimathea buys wrappings for the body. He rolls a stone against the door, places him in the tomb, and we are told at the end of this chapter 15, Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of Joses saw where the body was laid. Just a couple comments about this point here. Uh, it would be better to translate this. Uh, the original Greek has a way of describing the kind of action that is going on, whether an action is like a simple event that just occurs, or whether the action is something that goes on like this. And the verb that describes their action here is actually a verb that says it looks like this. And it would be better to describe this as saying Mary Magdalene and Mary the mother of, Je of Joses stood there watching what was going on. They, they stood there in observation of his placing in the tomb. And they, uh, what they watched was that the body was laid. On the other hand, the verb that is translated here was laid is a verb that suggests an action which is absolutely completed, perfect, done with, final action, final response. There is no, nothing left. So when, when his burial is described and he is placed in the tomb, it's saying he is really dead. He's not going to get up again. This is final uh, action of Jesus' life. Uh, the death is complete. None of the other gospel writers use that kind of language to describe Jesus' death. We do not expect him ever to get up again. This is the complete ending of the story. But then in the next verses, Sunday arrives, the Sabbath is over, the women come to the tomb. When the sun has risen, they've been saying to one another, who in the world's gonna roll away the tomb from the entrance? And when they arrived, the stone is already rolled away. And so they go into the tomb, they see a young man dressed in a white robe. He says to them, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified, but he has been raised. It's Easter Sunday. He is not here. Look, there's the place where they laid him. This time, the verb that says where they laid him is not perfect, done. It's simply an event. They put him there, but he's not there any longer. The the death has been reversed. He is now raised. And the instruction are, go tell his disciples and Peter that he has been raised from the dead. And he is going ahead of them into Galilee. And there you will see them, uh, just as he told you. He told you he was going to be raised. Go tell the disciples, etc. And if we stopped at that point in the narrative, we say, okay, we know how the story's going to go. They've been commanded, go tell the disciples. He's going ahead of them to Galilee. Go there and you will meet him. So what do the women do? Verse 8, so they went out, they fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them, and they said nothing to anyone because they were afraid. Period end of gospel. Now what kind of an ending is that? In previous lectures I've talked about the way in which Mark's gospel starts with that banner headline, uh, this is the beginning of the good news of Jesus the Messiah, but ends with kind of a whimper. The announcement is made, he's risen, he's not here, go tell, and the women flee from the tomb because they're so afraid and they say nothing to anyone. Now, how would that appeal to you as a telling of the gospel? A few comments about that. 
uh, many have uh, talked about the troubling ending of Mark. And one of the ways that we could probably uh, uh, evaluate that is noting that Mark was never the favorite gospel of the history of the Christian church. Matthew is placed first in our New Testament, and Matthew is the most popular gospel. What's the problem with this ending of Mark? Why is it so strange? There are no appearances of Jesus, only a promise that he's going to appear, and secondly, the silence of the woman here. They say nothing to anyone. First of all, they disobey the direct command of the person in the tomb, go and tell his disciples. They don't do that, and instead, they say nothing to anyone. When we look at what the situation of our manuscripts of the New Testament look like, all of our earliest and best manuscripts end right here at verse 8. So if you read, for example, the Gospel of Mark in the New Revised Standard Version, it stops at verse 8. The question that many have asked then in reading Mark's Gospel is, did Mark really end the story in that way? Is it really true that the gospel ends with the comment that the women flee from the tomb and say nothing to anyone? The only other option might be to say an original ending has been lost. It, you know, it's the last page and it got ripped off somehow and Mark wrote more. Scholars differ about the answer to those questions but they all are important because they have something to do with how we're going to read Mark's Gospel. Shall we read Mark's Gospel as if it actually originally ended at verse 8 with the women fleeing from the tomb and saying nothing to anyone? I happen to think that the answer is yes. It fits so well with the irony and the uh, way in which Mark tells the story along with disciples' misunderstanding about the secrecy and the hiddenness of the kingdom, so that at the end of the gospel, even the announcement of the resurrection says, now it, the, the story is out, but the question of how that story is going to be heard is left in the hands of you, the hearers. What is the evidence that might contribute to that? Perhaps the most astounding evidence exists in Matthew and Luke themselves. Matthew and Luke bear witness to their disappointment with Mark's ending because each of them constructs or adds an ending of their own. Matthew adds appearances of Jesus, not one, but two, and the uh, familiar Great Commission that comes at the end of, of his gospel, uh, a that is on a mountain, very much like the teaching of Jesus on a mountain. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, and remember I am with you always to the end of the age. Now that's much more like an ending of the gospel, much more satisfactory. Or Luke. Luke adds a long chapter that includes appearances to the women, and then to the, though you remember the story of the two disciples that are walking on the way to Emmaus and Jesus joins them and talks with them on the way and then he meets the disciples in the upper room uh, and talks and, and gives them a ascending assignment, a mission, uh, and then Luke goes on to speak of his ascension in these words. See, I'm sending you what my Father has promised, so stay here in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. What about in the manuscripts? Matthew and Mark, or Matthew and Luke are one clue uh, that, they're, that they didn't like the way Mark ended. Another clue is uh, what we see in the manuscripts, and that is uh, that in our, our manuscripts, there is not one single early or uh, of our best manuscripts that has anything following verse 8 in Mark's Gospel. 
But later on, by the time of the fifth century, we begin to see manuscripts that have two different options. One is commonly called the shorter ending. It reads like this. And all that have been commanded them, they told briefly to those around Peter, and afterward Jesus sent out through them from east to west the sacred and imperishable proclamation of eternal salvation. So uh, this short ending says they did what Jesus commanded, and Jesus sent them out in mission, and they proclaimed the word and good news of the gospel. And then there is a longer ending that occurs, and you can, if you want to read this, I have put it here, but if you want to read this, you can go to your Bible. Both of these will be at the end in the footnotes. Uh, it uh, was part of the reading of the gospel basically throughout most of the history of Christianity. All of our worst and latest manuscripts have this ending on them, and they, there was, it was the ending that was available to the translators of the King James Version, so it's familiar in the tradition. So, and it basically pieces together the story of what we read in the other two Gospels, uh, that uh, the women come to the tomb, and after they leave the tomb, they report this to the eleven, and then uh, Jesus s gives them a commission to go into the world and proclaim the good news and talks about the one who believes and is baptized will be saved. And then the Lord Jesus, after he had spoken to them, was taken up into heaven and sat down at the right hand of God. It's very clear that this is a later uh, kind of religious piecing together of the story of Jesus and tacking it on to the end of Mark's gospel. There is no scholar who assumes that th if there was an ending of Mark, it's clear this was not it. It was not added until the, the fourth or fifth century. And then there is one peculiar arrangement. There is one manuscript that we possess that has both endings pieced one after the other. The short ending followed by the longer ending. This probably reflects what was true of people in the early period. When they copied manuscripts, they were so concerned that nothing get lost. So if there was something, if they had one manuscript with a shorter ending and one manuscript with the longer ending, the scribe as he's copying the manuscript probably copied shorter ending, longer ending, and we end up with one manuscript that has both of the endings together. This is not a fun place to leave us, you might say, with the Gospel of Mark, but it shows many uh, of the things that are about the way in which we read Mark's Gospel. We've looked at the way in which Mark inexorably leads us to the passion and death of Jesus. And as we end the gospel, we might ask this question, how is it that we are to understand God's Messiah, the very Messiah of God who comes to deliver his people? How do we put this together with the, with the fact that God's Messiah is crucified on a cross and it's there at the very cross of Jesus when Jesus pro uh, expresses his utter f forsakenness. There we see the very Messiah of God that comes to us and gives his life as a ransom for many, that gives his life for his disciples who follow. I hope that this kind of quick introduction and overview of the Gospel of Mark will encourage you to read the Gospel and to meditate on the image of Jesus that Mark has portrayed for us, and perhaps then read it alongside of a Matthew or a Luke and see how Mark's story has its own clear uh, character and how it contrasts and shapes a story of Jesus that focuses so strongly in the passion and death of Jesus as the narrative of the way in which the good news of Jesus Christ takes its shape among us and calls us to, f to not fear, but only believe, as Jesus says to his disciples as they sail in the boat on the winds of the storms of life, such as they were on the Sea of Galilee. 
Thank you for your attention and for your partnership in this hearing of Mark's Gospel.